Hi, my name is Frankie Shizaki, and I want to talk about growing up in Guam post World War II. And in that period, can you imagine we didn't have internet and no Amazon? Those are things that came way, way later. In my era, we were lucky to even have food. So my, my story goes back to right after World War II. Guam was just devastated with two attacks on Guam. A Japanese attack in 1941 and then and the U.S. recapturing of Guam. So the Chamorro people were just devastated and massacred. Our island was just devastated, just destroyed. So the, the image of Guam today is very, very different from, from that era. But I want to talk about growing up here and being a, an immigrant local, which is kind of a strange phenomenon. So why am I an immigrant local? So my father is Chamorro and Japanese. And he grew up in Guam. He was born here, grew up here, lived in Suma. His story is really a, another story that has to be told separately. But uh, my father was was uh, was well off as a young man, and he had a, his, his father worked hard and had a bunch of businesses in Sumai. But he he was a spoiled child, and I hate to talk about my father. That way. But he was spoiled. He had the best of everything, and and his mother was his guardian angel. But his mother dies in 1939. And after that, his father goes, we need to correct you. So he sends my father to Japan. It's a wrong time in, in Guam, Japan history to be sending a child to Japan. And he sent him to go to college. But he didn't end up in college. He got conscripted into the Imperial Army and then ended up going to Manchuria and before the end of the war, going to the Philippines. And so there, that's a separate story that has to be told, but it would be another time. But my father gets wounded in the Philippines, and he quickly surrenders because I'm not going to do the death march, I think is what it was. He became a prisoner of war. And then uh, he passed his interrogations, and he got sent home and sent to Japan. But Japan wasn't his home. You know, he was longing to come to Guam. So he ended up uh, clearing every, all the restrictions in Japan, ended up working for the MacArthur government, and then meets my mother. And that starts our family. And then dad was longing to come home, so eventually he makes his way home, and then he had to petition for his wife and his child to come to Guam. And that was a long process, and part of that is part of our history. That Did you know that Guam was a restricted island? It was controlled by the Navy. People could not just come to Guam without getting permission from the Navy. So my father had to get permission from the Navy to allow his, his wife and his child to come to Guam. And I have a collection of uh, communications of some of classified. And eventually, my mother and I leave Japan. We end up in, in Wake Island and maybe in Guam using the old Pan American route. So Pan American is the airlines have been here for a long, long time. And that was our start. But I, what I remember is growing up in, in Guam in that era, right after the war, it was a uh, it wasn't what you see today. One of the stories is that people from Sumai were, were moved outside of Sumai in order to build Naval Base Long, which is what you see today. In the meantime, most of the people ended up in Santa Rita and Agate. And so my, what was interesting was Agate was Guam's first urban renewal project, I think. And Agate was a design community. So if you ever go to New Agate, that's the main village of Agate. Too. You see sidewalks, you get street lights, you get sewer system and paved streets. San Rita, on the other hand, in the old days, the commission of San Rita decided, no, we don't want that. We don't want an urban development there. Just give us our land. So, uh, so if you look at San Rita, you, the village of San Rita is not an urban renewal project. It just uh, there, there are really no paved sidewalks, even those street lights in there. And so when we moved. We, we ended up moving into an area behind the church of San Rita, behind that. And, and the street wasn't paved. We didn't even have gravel on it. It was a muddy road, which years later they put in uh, gravel, and then they eventually they paved. But eventually they put in a sewer system. That was the first urban renewal project for San Rita, a sewer system. But what I want to talk about is, is part of it is, is the growing up here, mixed ethnicity, being part of Japanese. In, in Port Chamorro, that 
growing up was just different. But I want to talk about discrimination. Did I experience discrimination? I said, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. You know, but, but the only discrimination I experienced was, as kids, instead of playing cowboys and Indians, like most American kids, what did we play in Guam? We played war. It was always the American soldiers versus the Japanese soldiers. And I was always the Japanese soldier. And whatever I did tactically with our games, even if I won the tactics, I would always lose. And they would say, you lost because you're Japanese. So that's probably the only discrimination I ever felt. Growing up, growing up here was just wonderful. It really was wonderful. And, and I can talk about uh, what my mom and parents did because we, you know, as much as dad's family was pretty, pretty decently, decent financially when he was growing up, the war just took all of that. My mom was devastated. Everybody became extremely poor. And uh, but then we had to build a house. We had to feed ourselves. And we didn't have the grocery stores that we had there. So all of our relatives, all of our neighbors, we all grew things. We grew vegetables, we planted trees, we planted bananas, we planted taro. In fact, and then we would have livestock. We'd always have pigs. We, had, you know, we didn't have cows in our area. But Goats. My dad was into goats. And we had chickens. And we had chickens that laid eggs as well. So that was all the stuff we grew in order to feed ourselves. And, and that was just a great time. I remember uh, being a goat herder early in my life. Because we ended up with a herd of maybe 40 or 50 goats. And we lived in an area behind, in the upper part of the village. And behind our house was government land. And behind that was Naval Magazine. It's still there. So behind our house was the government land, which is called Pialindu. So my dad rented a, a large tract of land for a dollar a year. And we thought we were going to branch and grow things, but no, it was just for the goats. So that was the range up in the hills for the goats. And, and that connects me to Cap Rojas. Cap Rojas was, was in Lower Santa Rita, kind of near Apra Mobile today. And Camp Rojas was the labor camp for Filipino workers. The Filipino workers were brought to Guam as part of the rebuilding of Guam. So it was a good combination. So, uh, so those people, the men that worked at Camp Rojas, knew where to find goat. It was always our house. So they would come to our house for Friday and Saturday for a weekend party. These guys were away from home. They were on a labor camp. And they wanted to celebrate the camaraderie. So Having a piece of goat was, was very important. It set them up. And so that gave us a part of our revenue for survival. We, 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 uh, we sold the goats. We also uh, butchered the goats for our meats. And, and that was part of our food. So anyway, the, the, uh, I want to talk also about, I think I mentioned the Japanese guilt. And, and growing up, I always felt guilty about the war. We had nothing, I had nothing to do with the war. My dad didn't, have, didn't want to be part of an American Japanese soldier. Uh, and he just wanted to get home. And, and so he survived the Philippines. The Philippines was just bad. Bad for everybody. Bad for the Filipinos, and certainly bad for the Japanese soldiers. Yeah, I think they were overextended, and everybody was miserable. We were starving. I remember that dad didn't share very much about his time in the military, with the Japanese military. But he shared about starving in the Philippines. And, and if you remember Taro, Taro comes in the nice little sweet little balls of Taro. But after that, you get the stock, which is uh, in the Chamorro word would be tatago. It would irritate you. They would have to eat that because that was the last remnants of anything from Taro. So the war was absolutely terrible. But, but, but yeah, and to that point, I want to talk about uh, my transition as a child and remembering how we lived in the world. Part of that is learning to speak English. The kids I grew up with did not speak English. None of us spoke English. And then we had to go to elementary school. And initially it was fine because we had, remember Mrs. Wesley, she was a village teacher, and she, she's Chamorro. So she would adapt communicating with us with Chamorro. So it was okay. But I remember going to the new elementary school, and we had this teacher from Nebraska. And I'm sorry I don't remember her name, but she didn't know a word of Chamorro, and I didn't know a word of English. 
and I felt like every time she would be lecturing, she'd be panning and looking at faces, and I would always duck my face down like that. It's like, basically, don't look at me, don't call me, because I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and I certainly don't know how to respond to you. That was my early, early response to, that, to education. And so we all had to learn English, and then we transitioned into that. And going into Agate Junior High after that was, was an eye-opening experience. Because if you remember, if any of you remember, Guam was pretty insular. You know, the neighborhood I grew up in San Luis, all Chamorro kids. I was the only oddball. I mean, there was other mixtures of Japanese, but, but it, was, it was predominantly just Chamorro with a little bit of Filipino blend and a little bit of Japanese blend. Chinese bread. But, uh, but one of the Agri Junior had was like, we, we got into an integrated school system because we had uh, military kids in the Navy and the Navy civil service employees with their kids. So all of a sudden had these uh, American kids and, and uh, you know, they were white and black and, and we all had Micronesian kids. We follow, so that was like, wow, there are other people around. You know, so that was that was good for me as as uh, developing into my adulthood and my career. Uh, but I want to also talk about the political arrangement of Guam. You know, Guam's got a long history of politics and political status. And during this period, uh, certainly Guam was an American territory since the Spanish American War. But Guam became a restricted island, as I mentioned earlier. And and people couldn't come here. And, and lifting of those immigration restrictions, freeing Guam was, and then having an elected governor and, and, and an elected legislature, all of that was part of developing Guam into a more uh, democratic society. And, and that opened Guam into, into what we have today. So we have tourism. Tourism in Guam could not flourish under the native government because it was restricted. And the restriction is like if you've ever gone to like Kwajalein Island or Diego Garcia. The restrictions are there. If you land on the airplane in Kwajalein, you cannot get out of here because it's a restricted island. So Guam has got such an island. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about dad building our home because building our home was, was classic tomorrow. And those, you know, because we, we learned to help each other out. It's about sustaining others, sharing your food, helping build, helping clean up. That's all part of the community picture of Guam that I remember. So that gets his land, and, and, and with his uh, family and neighbors, they built a small house, it was a 20 by 20 home made of wood and tin roof, the old picture of Guam, terminal houses. And, and we had an outhouse, we had outside kitchen, an outside shop. And mom was not happy with that, but that was life. I mean, that was all we could afford at the time. Eventually, the house was extended, typical to our own, we kept extending the house, and then uh, we put in a, a kitchen and a bathroom with a flush toilet. And my, my mom was going, wow, a flush toilet. She was so happy. Uh, to help, to help uh, mom was uh, uh, had a tremendous challenge for mom. Remember, my mother was Japanese. She was born and raised in Japan. And she left Japan to come to Guam, an unknown, mysterious destination. She was probably not very secure about coming to Guam. But she did. Out of the love for her husband, she came and, and we made Guam a home. And, and, and my mother, to the day she died, uh, she, she learned to speak tomorrow. She learned English and tomorrow. So we all did that. We learned to communicate in English tomorrow and Japanese. So if you were amongst our friends who were listening to our conversations, you, would not, you might get little snippets of the content, but no one could really get the full content of the conversation because we had our own language mixture. So that was growing up in Guam. I didn't get a chance to talk about growing up in the village, you know, on the street we lived in. And I said it was a muddy road, it was not paved. The bulldozers came and cleared the path, and that was the road in front of our house. And on that street was a tank, a World War II tank that just died there as part of the battle. That tank be became our base station for a plane. You know, and, and as kids, when, we, when it was time to play, we would all meet at the tank in order to play war, in order, in order for me to lose. No matter what I did, I lost. But the picture of that street was we had no sidewalks. We had no street lights. And there was no sewer system. It was just the way it was. And uh, 
let's see. I'm sorry, let's, let's pause there. Okay, what's the next one? I think I went to school so let's go to the next one. This would be good. This is, this is good. Part of growing up here created a problem for us as students. Because we often heard comments from visiting teachers from the mainland that education in the States was far better than Guam. Or in, indirectly, it would in, imply that our quality of education was not up to standard. And so we, I worried about the quality of my education. So part of my growing up, I mean, I went to all the public schools here, and, and then I started going to the States to go to college, which was part of the plan. Because in my first career choice, I was supposed to become an engineer. And I, but I didn't do that. And I think this is a classic tomorrow again. And, and I started going to become an engineer. And I didn't go to engineering school, even though I was already accepted to go to school, for two reasons. There are two reasons why I did not go to college in, in Milwaukee. It wasn't the weather. One of it was uh, I was uncertain about whether I could successfully complete college. So we had no counseling or guidance to, to tell us where we stand. And in the back of our heads, at least in the back of my head, I always felt like the quality of our education was substandard. So I wouldn't want my dad to, to borrow money to send me to college to go to college and then what if I fail? So that was a, a looming fear I had. But the other part is my girlfriend. What would I do with my girlfriend? And, and the girlfriend issue was really not an issue because we broke up after I went to college. Anyway. But, so I opted to go to the University of Guam and I majored in math. And, and uh, I found that UOG education was, was, was good. It was good for me in, in my careers as I as I move forward in my life. But I was still worried about the quality of my education. But as I said, the uh, quality of education was always a concern for me. And, and, and UOG was, uh, was easy for me to follow, and, and I, I marveled about the quality of education today. I look back at the University of Guam, and I was amazed at the kind of stuff we covered. I knew UOG education was, was very, very helpful for my careers moving forward. But that fear, that, that doubt of the quality of education was always going in my head. So when I got recruited by the Guam Police Department after graduating, and it wasn't my first choice of course, I had better choices, more money, but, but the Guam Police Department was compelling, and I demanded that they send me to grad school. So I went through their program, went to the police academy, and I had, had to kiss the dirt and do all the torture and survive that, and then I was off to grad school. And, the University of Pittsburgh, uh, I had no difficulties. And that was uh, reaffirming to me the quality of the University of Toronto education and the quality of my public school education in Guam. So that was reassuring for me. And it gave me the kind of confidence that, that, that helped me to develop all my careers. So in summary, I want to say that Guam was, has changed a lot. Surviving this environment was uh, the real first test for all of us. All of, the, all of my friends, all of my relatives, and uh, I, I remember the great kindness and sharing that we had in the in the Chamorro tradition. And I'm sure it's a, it's, a, it's a global tradition, especially in our region, but uh, it's what I grew up with. And so I am very thankful for having grown up in Guam, and I'm thankful for her struggling, for the struggles as part of that growth, and, and, and I can only thank our community, our island, and my family, and my friends, and the great mentors who pushed me, even though I didn't realize they were pushing me in certain directions. So thank you very much. Viva Guam. <laughs>